Grace and peace to you all from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. In case you hadn't noticed, it's not only Holy Thursday. It's also April Fool's Day. Today and this evening. And I couldn't, couldn't, I, I, I felt a temptation. I, here are some April Fool's jokes to start off with. Did you hear about the guy who swapped labels on the pumps at the gas station? You didn't? It was an April Fuels joke. What? What monster plays the most April Fool's jokes? Frankenstein. Here's one more. I heard the letters A and C were going to prank their friend, but they just let her be. Had enough? I thought so. Oh, here's one more, a little different than the others that I found. This is April Fool's Day, so believe nothing and trust in no one. On second thought, I guess that's just like any other day. Now, that last one is more cynical. And it is a good way to introduce to all of you the concept of a struggle between two views in life. The world's view of life versus God's view of life. We see that struggle tonight at the Last Supper. The struggle Jesus has with a worldview that warns you to believe nothing and trust no one. You see, at the Last Supper, and at every Lord's Supper since then, we witness a struggle between the kingdom that Jesus had been proclaiming from the first day, on the one hand, and the society around him that sought to deny the reality of that kingdom of God, on the other hand. Now, when Jesus stood up and preached say, the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain. These were sermons that started with how blessed are these people and how blessed are those people. With such blessings, Christ was contradicting a society that, like other societies down the centuries, denied the value of those whom he had blessed. The world denied, for instance, the value of those who were poor in spirit, denied the value of those who were poor in material things, of those who were meek, of those who were peacemakers instead of troublemakers, of those who were in mourning, mourning their losses, and of those who were naive enough to still be pure in heart. Christ brought outsiders to his table at every meal. People like tax collectors and prostitutes and others whom the Pharisees called sinners. Now, these so-called sinners were the many people who did not live perfect lives according to the Pharisees' overly strict interpretation of the law. Why, the Pharisees hated seeing Jesus eat with just anyone at his table. And so they called him names, glutton and drunkard among them. That is the background to this so-called Last Supper. This Last Supper, which was really just the last of many amazing suppers that Jesus had hosted during his three years of public ministry. And now in the world's eyes, these revolutionary meals were at an end. Jesus himself admitted that this was the last time in his earthly life that he would eat and drink with those who had followed him all these crazy and seemingly foolish years on the road. How appropriate then that this is April Fool's Day. As Beekner said earlier tonight, in terms of the world's sanity, Jesus is crazy as a coot. And anybody who thinks he can follow Jesus without being a little crazy too is laboring less under a cross than under a delusion. Well, just as one person's trash is another person's treasure, so one person's delusion is another person's dream. And Jesus dreamed that night of the Last Supper. Oh, did he dream. He dreamt big. He dreamt that this was not the end. And that night Christ spoke not just in one, but in four ways in order to proclaim to the frightened disciples that this was not the end. First, he told them that he would eat and drink with them again someday. He told them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. 
For I tell you, I will not eat it again with you until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. You see, he is telling them that he will die, yes, and eventually he will ascend to be at God's right hand. But this will not be really the last supper. Here, even more clearly, Christ is talking of a second coming, a second coming when the kingdom of God will be in full bloom and there will be one long great supper. You see, Jesus is pointing the disciples to the future, to the future, and giving them a sure and certain hope. Second, Jesus does something new with this meal. He relates it to what he is about to do on the cross. He grants such meaning to the eating of the bread. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He grants such meaning to drinking from the cup. This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus knows that he will give his body and blood for our sins on the cross. Jesus wanted the disciples and wants us to be constantly reminded of what his death was all about whenever we we receive Holy Communion. Thirdly, Jesus wants this supper to be a model for a Holy Communion of love for use by the church when the church is created by the Spirit at Pentecost. You see, the Lord Jesus on that evening empowered the disciples to continue holding Christ's meal for everyone. Jesus wanted his church to continue this meal with himself as spiritual host in the same way that he hosted physical meals on earth. And since then, confounding critics of this holy fool, Christ's foolish supper has continued throughout all of history. It's a supper spoken in every language on earth. It's a supper that brings people together who have never eaten together before. Why, I have seen over the years people being reconciled by eating this meal together. And I have seen over the years churches that used to persecute one another being reconciled by eating and drinking this meal together. I have seen the faces of those both giving the meal and taking the meal. Faces touched with awe and suffused with holiness. This last supper became the Lord's Supper. Supper, And through the Lord's Supper, Jesus Christ continues to bring us together. But this meal brings us together to do what? And here's the fourth great thing Jesus did at the so-called Last Supper. He dedicated drinking the Holy Cup Drinking the Holy Cup as a remembrance of the new covenant. The new covenant inaugurated by Christ's death and resurrection. We heard the new covenant prophecy from Jeremiah earlier tonight. It is a new covenant that improves upon the old. Because it relies solely on God. Relies solely on God's power and God's spirit. This new covenant is less about what we have to do on our own and more to do with what God does to ensure our salvation and inspire us to do God's will. Listen closely, for in this passage, God is only talking about what God is going to do. I will put my law within them, he says, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. (laughs) This so-called Last Supper is, in this sense, really the first, the first supper, the first supper of the new covenant kingdom. Now we, the body of Christ, join with Christ our head to host not only all of our communions, but also we will strive to live by the new covenant, by the Holy Spirit. You know, Paul once corrected the church in Corinth because they were not eating this meal together or in the right spirit. The rich Corinthians, who did not have to work long hours, got to the evening supper early and on a routine basis 
ate all the food and got drunk before their fellow members, members who were poor and had to work long hours, could even arrive. Paul told the rich Christians in Corinth that they had eaten the supper in an unworthy manner. Why? Well, because he said they did not discern the body, the togetherness of all their fellow Christians in Corinth. They were not pausing to make sure that the least of these among them had joined them to eat the food. So Paul urged the rich ones to wait, to wait and eat and drink the supper together with the poor ones as a sign of their equality and their unity in the Lord, as as a sign that they were indeed a new covenant community. What it means to be a new covenant community is that we serve the least of these as Jesus did and as he calls us to do. In fulfilling God's call, we may look like fools sometimes, if we have to. But we don't mind. We don't mind that because we know the first fool is God himself. (laughs) As Paul wrote, the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. As Deborah Dean Murphy has written, into the chaos and confusion of human existence, the God of heaven stoops to dwell, into deceit and double dealing, into the misery, fraud, and loneliness of our small lives, into this and more. The word, she says, became incarnate and lived among us, full of grace and truth. Then Murphy reminds us about Jesus. That the life he lived led to the death he died. He loved others in a manner that the world called foolish. And it is that kind of unconditional love which led to his cross. And which should lead us to our crosses. My fellow brothers and sisters of the new covenant. Of the ever growing kingdom of God. As you and I partake yet again tonight of this holy meal, let us also continue to partake of the love of God by serving as God's ministers every day. Sure, the more people we know, the more difficulties we will know and be a part of. (laughs) That's the price God pays. That's the price Christ pays. That's the price the Holy Spirit pays. And that is the price that we pay. For loving others no matter what. But you know, our spirits really wouldn't want it any other way, right? And why? Because you see, our spirits know that it is the way of life that really is life. Life abundant, life eternal and true. So let us take Christ's body and blood into us that we may go out and be good fools. What do I mean by good fools? Fools that pray, fools that worship, and fools that serve the world that God loves foolishly. Amen.